Good morning, Justin. Good afternoon, Jason. I mean, I guess it depends where you are, right? Oh, that's right. It's it's 1.30 in the afternoon here. Before I guess, it is 10.30 in the morning. Because he's in a nicer him. area than us. <laughs> he's he's in a lefter area than us, uh, me, meaning uh, geographically speaking, not a... Oh, geez. Okay, never mind. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> Justin, how are you this afternoon? I'm doing good. You know, we, you know, it's it's amazing. Things are starting to open up again. I actually had a rehearsal for my for a, my first uh, live classical performance, which is going to be next week in the Philadelphia area. Wow. Yeah, I'm 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 pumped. Your it's voice exciting. is so powerful, though. Are you worried about spreading germs to the audience? You know, it's uh, it, it's going to be outdoors. Also, ladies and gents, I'm totally vaccinated, and I will be, I will be a number of feet away. In fact, whenever I sing, we make sure that we are double this. We're we're twelve feet away because of the aerosols, especially when I'm singing. So, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, man, we got to. We're, we're still being careful. We're still doing what we got to do. So, uh, my friends, yeah, check out uh, check out Justin Gonzalez Tenor on Facebook if you want some more information about that. But that's not why we're here. We're here for hi. I'm Jason. <laughs> How are you doing, Jason? I'm good. I'm so... Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> he got so bored with what I was saying. He's like, geez, I'm going to watch our show bored. instead. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I, I We have an exciting guest backstage, and let's do our housekeeping before he eats all the sushi. <laughs> you know what? Let's do that. It's a great idea. Hello, ladies and gents. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this uh this afternoon again if you're watching live if you're catching this as a rebroadcast hello and thank you so much for being with us if you want to catch some of our past episodes finished products head on over to youtube.com slash user slash super jpo 711 or just go to youtube.com and type in hi i'm jason and uh you will find our show plenty of fantastic uh past shows with fantastic guests and we are so glad to add one more to our list uh if you are watching hey, on Mary. twitch Please be uh, be sure to follow us on twitch.tv slash HIJ podcast to uh, not just enjoy our show, but also the things that we decide to host. And you never know, some nights my, me and Jason, our insomnia syncs up and we decide to go live in the middle of the night. So you won't know if that, what, when that's happening unless you follow us on twitch.tv slash HIJ podcast. Also, we try, try, try our best to disseminate all information on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Jason and Justin. Also, you can just uh, type in the search bar, hi, I'm Jason, and you'll find us. Uh, but again, facebook.com slash Jason disseminate. and Justin. Yes, not inseminate. That's something. Uh, very. That's, uh, yes, that's, the, you know, it's the <laughs> afternoon time, so we can't go by our unofficial title, The Morning Wood. Uh, so, <laughs> well, maybe, maybe for our guests, since it's 1030 in the morning for him. Uh, and uh, lastly, my friends, if you want to support what it is that we're doing over here, you can visit our digital tip jar on Venmo by searching at symbol Jason dash Pollock dash two. Again, that helps us do improvements on our show. It also helps Jason over here keep his Wi-Fi on. So please, my friends, do not walk, run and uh, help us any way that you can. And again, we just absolutely love being able to put on these shows for you and jason that is all of the news that i have who do we have watching i see we have some comments we have here. margarita in there tom sugar and i appreciate you guys stopping by and saying hello hey hey um they're gonna love our guest because i love him i'm so excited to bring him out he's he's a face if you look up his imdb he's got so many credits hello lulu lounge He's been in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Friends, Seinfeld, Escape from Alcatraz, just to name a few. He's just an incredible actor, and I'm so honored that he decided to join us this morning in California and he, this afternoon here in Jersey and this evening in England. Um, yes. <laughs> please, let's bring him out. Larry Hankin. Ooh, Larry Hankin. Yeah. Cool. How you doing, guys? Great. Larry, How are thank you? you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be joined or, or to be invited <laughs> in. Thank you very much. Of course. Larry, you're so recognizable. You're such an icon in the pop culture world. I, How I, I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm still fighting to get uh, a name to the face. That's, that's my big... <laughs> 
That's my bucket list. That <laughs> <laughs> you'll say the name. Yeah, if every you the name you you understand. Oh, oh, that's the guy. Or if you see my picture, you go, that what, what that that's the guy. That's that guy. Exactly. I, I want to get it you know, together. Oh, that's Larry Hankin. Oh, uh, yeah, right. So yeah, it's a big. Uh, it's a dream. It's a dream. <laughs> Sorry, Justin. Oh, no, no. I, I was just going to say, though, I, I just uh, I, I remembered on the post that I made last night on social media, I had said that you have almost uh, 200 credits, according to yeah. uh, IMDb. I'm looking at 195 projects you've been a part of in some way, shape or form, either as uh, as a guest, uh, a, a, a guest actor or as a recurring role. I mean, that's. What a hell of a career, my friend. And you work I mean, with the legends. You work with the best. And, th and that's only the stuff I've done on the screen. Yeah, and, <laughs> and that, but but that's the that's I, I made sure to make that that uh, that that um, that distinction when I made. I'm writing a book right now about what I've done when you're not watching me. <laughs> <laughs> much more <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Much more interesting, <laughs> uh, and 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 also uh, wh what I did w right before I got on camera. In other words, what I was doing on the set, what was going on, you know, with me, because uh, I, I just got to tell you in front, I'm a, I'm a dyslexic, uh, so I I have dyslexia, so I interpret reality in, in just a slightly different way than uh, you two people do, uh, and and this is been proven over my lifetime that oh i'm not they're looking at it in a different way you know whoever i'm with and so it it it, it uh, sometimes it butts against reality so that becomes very interesting to to read about i'm betting so you're you kind of see the world through the eyes of like david lynch yeah and uh you, there's a lot of us there are a lot of us out there so just be careful okay. <laughs> Yeah. Just warning. You. Uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of famous actors are dyslexic, and it, it takes a. It's slightly different uh, in each person. In other words, it's not an exact replication of uh, what, what do you call it? So it's not always just reading backwards. In other words, I can't. I, it's very hard for me to memorize lines, uh, written written lines by other people mainly. Uh, sometimes by myself, but. Uh, who's uh, the you know the guy from um, for the Fonz? The, who, who's the Fonz? Henry oh, um, Winkler. Henry, yeah. yeah, a big, big dyslexic guy. Really? Major wow. dyslexic guy. Yeah. So I don't understand because he has very difficult time remembering lines too. Uh, Do they give you a lot of opportunity to improv in the roles you take? Well, sometimes yes, yeah, so sometimes not. But but in the beginning, it it was really hard because. Uh, you know, I'm just a new guy, just, you know, another actor. And I would go up on my lines or something like that. Or, or I would, no, I would ask for time because uh, I knew in front that I had dyslexia. See, when I was an improv guy, I was in Second City in the committee. Uh, it didn't matter. I, I could improvise like that. For dyslexic, that's easy. I have total, uh, what do you call it, access to my subconscious. <laughs> Total access. If you put a if you put a camera and a light on, well, this is back in the day when we were. I mean, you, you've got a improv is just like any other athletic exercise. I mean, you got to work out at it. You have to exercise. Oh, yeah. Improv rules. There are rules to it, and you. So I can yes, I can and. improvise with you guys now. It's like a muscle. It's it's just like I'm any sure. other you know thing. So, but when I was good at it yeah you just at the drop of a hat i could improvise anything because i had total access to the creative part of my brain did you is that where you started at second city excuse me did you start at second city is that right yeah i started at second city and then a couple of us just broke for san francisco and started our own company called the committee and what we had in mind was to rival second city and we did it we became a tourist attraction of san francisco like uh second city is a tourist attraction in chicago so it, it took us uh two years to do it to and but we were there for 10 years so i was really a good improviser but then you know i went down and started 
memorizing lines and I lost that. Yeah, I wasn't in shape. So I, I kind of lost that ability, that muscle. I lost that muscle. Uh, but then I was confronted with memorizing lines and that I was, I hit a wall because I, I hadn't used the dyslexia or I was using the dyslexia in a very improvisational way. I was a stand up comedian before I went into improv and I would talk off the top of my head, just like I'm doing with you guys. I would get up on the stage and I would talk to the audience and I would be very funny because I could talk about anything and I would, you know, feed off of how they were feeling, where they were laughing. You know, I'd go with that. But then when I started memorizing lines, it was like a wall and I, I uh, would need a week, be a week more than everybody else. That, and then I could do it. I just, it was a time involved. Not that I couldn't memorize right. it, but it was very difficult for me. When I would look at a pay, I remember exactly uh, working with Vince Gilligan. I did uh, um, uh, El Camino when I did the movie. I, I did two shows and then I did the movie. And he liked me, I guess, so much uh, that he wrote um, a monologue for me and, and just presented it to me. Or he didn't, but it was given to me uh, on the day of the shoot. And that, that, that that's like freaked me out. You I, you. You can't do that to Larry Yankin. It's <laughs> no man. I freaked out. I mean, in the dressing room with the with the uh, AD, the assistant AD. The guy was about I don't know. He's about twenty. I mean, he just got freaked. You know, I I, I got to go back to the set. I can't be here now. And he just split. So well, I said, you literally oh, freaked out. out. Excuse me. So you literally freaked out. You had a no. I just like I went. I can't do this, man. No. What? What? Are you? I got like kind of angry, excited. No, what, what do you mean? You, I have to, how, how long do I have? You know, he said two hours. I can't memorize this in two hours. You know, I just, that kind of freak out. Yeah, he, yeah, he didn't like yeah. the anger about, what, what do you mean? I want, so I want to, let me talk to Vince. He's not here. Oh, Christ. You know, I mean, he split. So I just improvised uh, that. You can watch it. You can watch my improv. Uh, but I, I couldn't do it in two hours. I tried. Uh, what I did was I just read it for two hours over and over and over again. And um, I, I got the gist of it was a it was law. It was a law thing. I was trying to keep the cop out of the Winnebago because they were hiding inside. It was, uh, you know, uh, I was out in the desert. I was old Joe. The uh, So they were hiding. Uh, Aaron and Brian were hiding in the Winnebago and the cop. I was talking to the cop and I had a, what he wrote. What he had somebody write. It wasn't Vince who wrote it, but he had somebody write it. Uh, a long legal explanation to the cop of why he couldn't go in there because the Winnebago was on my property and he didn't have a search warrant. So it was a long legal thing. Uh, and, and of course, the character would have that information because he was dealing and crushing illegal cars, stolen cars. Mm -hmm. So he would have all that legalese ready because he knew the cops might come. But I couldn't memorize it. So I just improvised that. I thought, well, let me dig deep and see if I can. You hit the important points, so, though, right? Excuse me? You hit the important points, so. Well, I, I, I had no, uh, I, I, didn't give, I didn't give an F about that. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to get at something out that they could use and not, know that I was improvising a written <laughs> monologue. That was my my key. They'll never know that I improvised this <laughs> was my, my key to not running scared or, you know, just out, out into, into the desert. Uh, so what I did was I, I improvised. I just, uh, you know, I wouldn't cop to it. See, I, I didn't tell anybody that I didn't memorize it. When, yeah. when they said, okay, you're up, you know, get out there. I get, I get out, you know. See, I, what I did was I, I made up a um, an excuse why um, either I, I I couldn't why I why I might not be able to say it verbatim. Okay, that was as close as I would get. But then I say, "Are you ready to go, Larry?" Say, yeah. Oh, and then I here's what I did. What I did was I figured out how I would be able to memorize it if he let me, if the director and the crew and the producers would let me do it my way. So, yeah, I thought, hmm. 
they'll never know, and they will let me do it my way. And it's, the assumption of a guy in panic is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and he wouldn't go with and you'd, yeah I'll get away with this sure <laughs> they'll never know I, 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 Vince Gilligan won't know and so he said are you ready I said fine and I had already so I said listen I, I know how to shoot this I figured out how we can shoot this I said to the director and he looked at me did like he a, love that he, he did and he looked at me he goes really Larry you figured out. Um, <laughs> I said, yeah. I mean, you know, like a totally innocent. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, okay, let's hear it. And anyway, he really was, I, I hooked him. I go, well, okay. What we, what we can do is see, we'll shoot it in sections, you know, like you shoot me, I'll say something and then you go to the cop and then you cut to the, you know, like I was like in the editing room. You know, and then we'll cut to the cop, and then we'll cut to the Winnebago, and then we'll cut to me. And while you're shooting them, I could memorize the next section. And he said, um, well, that's that's an interesting way to go, Larry. Uh, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to shoot it in one take. It's a walk and talk. You're going to get 100 feet down there, and you're just going to say the whole thing right up to the camera. Cut. And we have a limo right here. We were out in the middle of the desert. I mean, that was a junkyard reel in, in the middle of the desert. And we have a, a limo right here, and you'll say it. It'll be one take. You'll walk, you'll talk, cut, and you'll hop in a limo, and we'll drive you back to production, and you're through for the day. So that's it. How about that? And I said, okay, that's that's fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay you, you can do that? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay, so get 100 feet out there and just walk towards the camera. I'll give you, a, uh, you know, action, walk and talk, and one take, we're out of here. Okay. I, I get down there, and uh, I thought, okay, I'll just, you know, I'll improvise it. It'll be cool. So I did. He said, all right, and action, Larry, and I walked and I talked. And all that was in my mind was no ums, no uhs, no stuttering. Just keep your mouth moving. Don't get your tongue mixed up with your teeth. And we're cool. Okay. So I started to walk and talk. And I'm just legalese. I'm just, you know, saying legal stuff. Da, 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 da. And then I thought, I don't know. And I, it's really, I have two minds. I'm, I'm saying the words, but I'm also thinking, this is not going. I'm going to be tired. <laughs> this is, there's no way I can get away. You know, once I was doing it and understood that I was making this up and it wasn't what Vince Gilligan wanted. I thought, okay, I'm going to be fired at the end. So that was it. I, I suddenly relaxed in the middle, blah, 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 and cut. And I turned to the director. He was standing right there, right next to the camera. And I'm saying, okay, now I'm going to get fired. And he goes, okay, uh, let's just do one more and then uh, we'll let you go. Okay. Let's wow. just do what we take, but we got it. And I was shocked, man. I thought, <laughs> I did it. Holy <laughs> cow. Now I don't have to worry. I could do ums. I could do errs. I could stutter because they got it in the can. At least they got it. And so, uh, but I'll do He says, okay, so get down there. I get down there. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a, what they call a script girl on the set. And what she does is her job is to just re, uh, tell you when you leave out a word or a sentence. And they'll uh, circle it. Yeah, he's Justin is laughing already. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is going. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and Jason too. <laughs> you see where it's going. Everybody out there knows where this is going. So I get out there, and uh, all of a sudden, I see the script girl. Actually, it's a woman. I don't know why they call it a girl, but okay. This script woman comes walking towards me now. I've been through this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an actor. I've been around, I've been around the block. So I go, okay, she's going to tell me what I left out. And I thought, well, he said we got it. So it's a word or a sentence and I can handle that. Okay. So she comes up and she says, um, and I go, okay, what did I leave out? And she just shows me the script. Every fucking word is circled. Every word. <laughs> And I, I've never seen, I've been in this, you know, 192 
things I've acted in. Never have I seen a page like that. It was amazing. I thought, wow, man, you're really doing your job. That's really cool. You're on the ball. Thank you. You earned your cash, you know. And I said, well, but I got the gist of it, right? And she says, um, the director wants it read as written. And I said, I want to talk to Vince Gilligan. He's not here. Oh, I want to talk to the writer. The director wrote the speech. <laughs> and then I hear the director yell, everything okay, Larry? Yeah, everything's fine. Okay. And then he starts walking towards me. And I thought, okay, when two people have walked towards you, that's not good. <laughs> it's not good. The relief it's pitcher's warming up. Good. Yeah. And he says, uh, you having difficulty? I go, no. I, I just wouldn't cop to it. I just wouldn't. I don't know. He says, okay. Then the cameraman, the cinematographer, says, is anything wrong, Jake? And Jake yells, no, it's okay. Don't you want to be by the camera? And I'm just standing there. Why don't they just fire me? Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I was getting bored with this. I really was. Uh, because that's part of the dyslexic <laughs> go-to. Yes, you know, yeah, you've been in these kind of situations and you just want it over with. And so he goes, no, I'm going to walk with my actor. And he's got the script. And I go, no, this is like kindergarten. He's going to walk with me right next to me. <laughs> oh, God. Says, yeah. And he goes, Where did, where's the frame end? You know, and it was right off my shoulder. It was about here. It was, it was just a frame like that. And he goes, okay, I'm going to stand right here, Larry. Is that okay with you? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. And uh, he says, okay, all right, and action, Larry. And I just did the same thing. He didn't give me any directions or he didn't talk to me. He just said, okay, action, go, Larry. And I'm walking. By the way, when they use your name, Larry, yet, it's not good. When they start using your name. As opposed to your character's uh, name or Mr. Hayes. Or your character's name or just, you know, just come over here and do this or, you know, the, just general stuff. Or when he talks to you, you go over there. But when they say Larry, it's not it's not good. So he says, okay. And he's walking. And he says, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I go, blah, 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 blah. And I see him walking. I can, you know, see just at the And he's got his head buried in the book. And he's, like, and he's walking and I'm walking and walking. And I go, okay, when I get to the end, then I'll be fired. Then I go, <laughs> ah, damn, cut. Okay. All right, Larry. Larry's dismissed. Thank you very much. You know, and they clap. You know, they always clap when any actor is dismissed. Okay, Larry's going out. I get in the limo and I drive, and the limo drives away. And I go, what the fuck happened? I, I, I had no idea what, I, how can they? So I had to wait. I called the production company. So when is this episode going to be on? Uh, it was, that was an episode. And um, he, they go in two weeks. So I waited two weeks and I phoned all my friends and I said, watch it because I want to ask you questions about it because I wanted to see what they thought or how it went, yeah. whatever. Or if they even used it, I don't know. So I watch it finally, and I'm, I'm all, all on tenterhooks and stuff, and I watch it. And here's what it was. And I, I said to my friends, I got, okay, did you watch it? Yeah, I called them immediately as it was over. Did you watch it? Yeah. What did you see? Uh, you were walking and talking, talking about some legal stuff to the cop to keep him out of the Winnebago. Brian and Aaron were hiding in there, and there was a cop, and there was you, and you were walking. No, that's 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 not what you saw. No, that's what you what you saw. Okay, and I and I called three or four friends. I went through the same thing. What did you see? Walking, talking, cop hiding. No, that's not what you saw. Well, what did I see? What you saw was me starting. I memorized the first line. So you see me, you know, okay, and you can't go in there because blah, blah, blah. And then they cut to the cop listening to me. And then there's a voiceover of me talking. And then they cut into the Winnebago. And then they cut back to the cop. And I'm still talking. I'm, I'm talking. It's a voiceover. And then, then they cut to me because I said something that was right on, you know, improvisationally right on to what needed to be said. They cut to me for... One sentence. So now I've said two sentences on camera. You know how long it takes to say a sentence? It takes two seconds or maybe three if you're talking slow. So that's six seconds. 
back to the cop, into the Winnebago, uh, a close-up on Brian, a close-up on Aaron, back to a close-up on the cop, another one to me, Aaron, Aaron, blah, 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 back to me, that's it. I was on a screen for 10 seconds. Uh, that was it. <laughs> and what they did was, and the director knew from the second line I said the first time I started to walk, he knew I didn't have it. This guy does not know what's going on uh, as far as what he wrote. But I had said enough legal things to keep the cop out of there that they just cobbled together a voiceover. And then they just cut to me three times. I think it was three times, not four. Three times, uh, nine minutes, uh, nine seconds. Uh, cut to me whenever I said something that applied and worked. And then anything else they garbled while they were talking inside or, or whatever. Because I listened very carefully to the voiceover. I, I watched it twice. I would recorded it and watched it twice. So whenever I said something that didn't really apply but they wanted to hear the talking, they muffled it or they lowered the sound and brought up what they were saying, you know, the, the cop or whatever. And it worked perfectly, but I, I talked to everybody and nobody knows the difference. They That's all- That's brilliant me. editing. But, yeah, but it was the director who knew that because he didn't get mad at me. He didn't say, I didn't write that He got it shit. in his head automatically. He, he started to edit immediately. He said, this guy is improvising. I'll have him do it again to cover any spots. That's why his head was buried in the in the text. He he was listening for when I would hit a marker on in the, that was a that had to be said in the script. And he was listening for that and I did between the two takes hit all the stations of the cross that he needed. And so he said, "Okay, after two, goodbye, you know, Larry's dismissed. I got it." But it was the director who was you know the, the genius of that. Of that. that but is it's, it's movies is a it's movies is magic, which is the name of a friend's production company. Movies is magic, and it and it is. And the second thing I learned about that is you can if you're in a movie, any kind of movie, film short, if it's on film, even on tape, if you're in a movie, you can't be bad. It's impossible because they'll just not use it, or they'll put a voiceover, or they'll edit around it, use your voice, and cut to somebody else if you just look bad or doing something wrong. So it's all in the editing room where, where the creativity, you know, goes. Anyway, that makes sense. I, 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 every time I did a film, like I just did a bunch of indie films, but uh, we do. They'd say action. We do our thing. Cut. Okay, now we're gonna. And I, in my head, I'm like, "Well, was that okay? Did you guys? Nobody, nobody gives me any feedback on that. I, I'm so neurotic, though. And you're right. That's what it is. They can fix it. Well, well, a they can fix it, but but b if you are a director, you know this, uh, or, or I don't know, maybe people tell you this, but um, the best. And I've worked with a lot, like three or four really top of the line. I mean, like John Houston. John Hughes, Larry wow. David. I mean, these guys are, you know, they, they know what they're doing. And all of them do not direct. They do not give you direction. They'll, they'll maybe uh, say, you know, could you go over here instead of over there because the camera, you know, I can't get the camera over. Uh, you know, they'll work within the framework of, of technical stuff. But as far as, you know, saying, you know, no, or be angrier or be mad or, or, or be quiet or, or or tell you how to act, they don't they don't do that. So the, the first clue was when um, I was talking to uh, a, a, a major, major star uh, on another movie, but he had worked with Woody Allen. And uh, I was asking him about Woody because I used to open for him, Woody, a, as a stand up comedian. Wow. Uh, I was a stand-up comedian. So uh, I asked him about, you know, what's it like being directed by him? And he said, it, it's, it's a horror trip. He doesn't direct. He just stands there. He doesn't give you anything. He doesn't say anything. And I started to ask around, and it turns out, no, none of the directors that I worked with or that other stars worked with that were major directors, they don't. What, what they'll do is they'll give you maybe a suggestion of uh, 
Uh, somebody uh, described it as like poetry. Uh, it's a, a poetic direction. They'll give you a suggestion of something that might trip you off into where he wants you to go, but he'll never tell you where he wants you to go. And and I've never been directed by I, uh, Don Siegel, you know, on Escape from Alcatraz. Never gave me a direction. I was there for three months on, on Alcatraz. Never directed anybody. I, you I were so good I, in that, though. You knew what to do. Well, no. What what he would say was, like, this is the, the, the extent of the direction that Don Siegel gave me. All right, cut. Larry, come here. And the great ones take you aside. They don't direct you or, or even talk to you in front of people. They'll take you aside, maybe put their arm around you. I remember Don Siegel took Clint Eastwood aside. He wanted to talk to him about the scene, and he put his arm around him. And I thought, that's, that's what I want. I want a great director to put his arm around me and tell me about the scene. That's, that's, that's another bucket list I have. And so, <laughs> so what, what he would uh, do um, is he'd say, Don Siegel directing me, you know, he'd say, cut, Larry, come here. And he would call me aside and he would walk aside. He didn't put his arm around me, but it was almost, you know, he was walking and talking with me. And he said, what are you doing? And I was... <laughs> <laughs> I was shocked. I go, what, what do you mean, what am I doing? So you, you're in the cell there. Well, he, here's the setup. Uh, you know, if I get too loquacious, just shut me down. But uh, what, it, what the scene was, he said, Larry, come here. I would always show up. And there was very few days that I wasn't on camera somewhere. So I would always have to go to the island and get on a freaking boat at 8 o'clock in the morning and stay there until 8 o'clock at night when the only boats came back. So if you, if you were called and you were going to shoot at like 5.30 p.m., you had to get up at six o'clock, get down to the dock, and get on an eight o'clock boat or a seven thirty boat. Oh my god! Because or else you can't get out on the island, and you fuck. Yeah. You know. So, and there was only one boat that left at noon, and that was only for CEOs and producers, and you couldn't get on it, even if you were dying. The ambulance had to wait or get there at <laughs> seven thirty in the morning. <laughs> or, or wait until <laughs> 8 o'clock at night for one of the boats to go out there to pick us up. So, I mean, it was just, we were trapped out there. So it was like being in prison, strangely. Uh, but you so, escaped. What? But you escaped. But but I, I did escape after, th after three months. So anyway, the, the scene was that Clint Eastwood and the warden, uh, uh, McGowan, uh, we're, we're talking, but they were talking like this to one another. That he wanted Clint, uh, Don Siegel wanted a uh, uh, side view, you know, profile. So he, he was shooting this way, and they were talking this way. But they were up on Tier C, which is where our cells were, and it was an empty cell. So they had to get the camera way back. He wanted the, the empty cell, or he wanted the cell as the background. But he didn't want. He didn't want across. In other words, you put the camera in the cell and shoot the other way. You want to shoot in. So they had the camera over the back. They had a board or something over the tier, and they were shooting this way. And he says, Larry, because I always show up, because I always wanted to watch. I, I was always on the set, even if I wasn't working. I just, and I would always be in costume, the, the, the blue thing. So he said, oh, Larry, uh, get in that, get in that cell. I go, why? I'm not, I'm not in this. I'm not even supposed to work today. Now, get in the cell. I go, why? He says, because I'm shooting a profile and it's an empty cell. I just want a body in there. There's a hole in the middle of the, 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 the frame. He says, so get in there. Just get in there. I go, well, well, what am I doing? It doesn't matter. Just get, get in there. It's just a body. I want a body. Okay, okay. And he would talk to me like that because he, he was like my grandfather. We were like grand, grandson and grandfather. I mean, we were like friends, yeah, kind of, professional, yeah, professional before. friends. I mean, he, he, would, he, he wouldn't talk to anybody else like he talked to me. He was like, come here, you know. Oh, and it, okay, I get it. So he says, okay. And so they're talking. Clint and the warden are talking. I'm in there. Oh, so I said, how much time do I have before you're going you're gonna to shoot? He said, well, we got to set up the lights. So you got about four minutes, but maybe five. Okay, I'll be right back. So I run to the prop department 
uh, Warner Brothers prop department on Alcatraz. You know, they trucked in stuff and had big tables with all kinds of props. It just it was a it was a ten pole movie. They they could no, spare no expense. So I go up and I run up and I said, "Yeah, give me a checkboard, a checkerboard, and some checkers." Well, what do you want this for? Well, they, they they got me in a scene there. They got me in a in a cell, and I want to be doing something. I'll be playing checkers or something. So we don't have a checkerboard. Well, what, what, what do you got? I got it. I got a chessboard. I got a ch chess set. Oh, give me the chess set. Okay, fine. So I get the chess set. I'm in there. I'm setting up stuff. Uh, all right. <laughs> and then he, that's how friendly he was. He goes, okay. Clint gets Clint in there. He gets McGowan in there. They're the stars of the fucking movie. I'm, I'm just, you know, some guy. And he goes, and he goes Larry, you ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Okay, okay, we're going to do this. No, man, that's cool. uh, so he goes, okay, and action. And I know they do this. Uh, cut. Larry, come here. Now what? Okay. So I go over and he takes me and he says, What are you doing? I said, I'm playing checkers. You got a chess set. Yeah, I know, but see, Alcatraz <laughs> doesn't have a checkerboard or checkers for Charlie, Charlie Butts, my character. So Charlie accepted a, a chess set to pass the time, but he doesn't know how to play chess. He only knows how to play checkers. So he's playing checkers with the chess set. He says, that's what you're doing? I go, yeah, but I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. I don't have to do anything. No, no. I just want to know what the hell you're doing. That's all. That's all. Get back in there. It's okay. Go, oh, go. So, so that's my relationship. You know? I love that you're so professional. You, you, no matter how small the part, you come up with the backstory. Yes, yes, yes. And there's and later on. Yeah, yeah. And he, because I used it again later on for another excuse. He asked me why I was doing something. And I gave him a huge backstory, which, you know, I just made up before I got to him. And he said, what are you doing? Backstory. <laughs> it's so, great speak, speaking of uh, improvisation and backstory because that, that's such a beautiful improvisation moment of the okay I've, I'm, I'm making uh, you know Shinola out of shit you know kind of a situation and uh, M Mrs. Bannis one of our listeners uh, obviously is a big Shinola uh, out of shit and there's no shoes for miles right, right. <laughs> 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 Well, Mrs. Bannis, though, is a big uh, fan of Friends, and she wanted to know about uh, how much Mr. Heckles did you improvise? That character was too perfect. Well, to, to be totally honest, I made, and this is compliments to the writers, I made no improvisation at all. It was as fucking written. And... Thank goodness, because I got the character off of the page mm -hmm. I, I, because it was so solid that all I had to do was show up. I mean, and, and say the words and it was Mr. Heckles. I mean, the attitude was there. The Yeah, I, I mean, the whole thing, the hair, the everything, the costume, it was all on the page. I, I was brilliant. Uh, and it's the most famous thing i've ever done i mean i can't stop being mr heckles it's crazy. You know, when i when we announced that you were going to be on the show people were commenting oh my god that's the guy from planes chains and automobiles the guy from friends seinfeld escape from alcatraz they're naming your credits but my niece reaches out and said that's the guy from the three little pigs whoa <laughs> yeah <laughs> Okay for your, your niece, man. <laughs> was right that on. Show, was okay. that the show you did? <laughs> was it's that cool. was that the Shelley Duvall thing you did? Was that was that the fairy tale? That was a fairy tale theater. Uh, okay, I got a story about that. I've never even thought about that, but yeah, there was a, a, a an aha moment uh, on Three Little Pigs. The director. Was oh man, I can't remember his name, but he's a good a good friend. I haven't seen him in years, uh, but but he was a friend of mine because we were in the committee together, in years oh, before okay. that. So uh, and the and that was the only reason that I believed what he told me, uh, because he gave me a direction, uh, or or, a, or or not a direction but a suggestion. Um, I was Mr. Man for the Three Little Pigs. I was I was the guy selling him the bricks, the straw. 
you know, the, the mud, whatever they made their houses out of. I, don't know. <laughs> I saw them in a pig pen. So anyway, uh, we did we did a red and and uh, Fred uh, Fred Willard sure. was in it. And, oh, oh, and uh, yeah, there was just three stars with the, with a Mr. Man. Uh, Fred Willard and uh, another guy I can't remember his name, but he's he's big now. He's got a movie out right now. He's a stand-up comedian. Uh, anyway, wow. so so uh, we do we do the scene. You know, we shoot the scene. We rehearse it. We we shoot it. And the director comes up to me and he says, uh, "I I think you're going in the wrong direction. See that? See that's that's a direction because it's not specific. It's non-specific, but it's a good du direction. It gives you a, a hint as to." where you can go and do whatever you want with it. But says, I think I was either too low or too high, or I was too too uh, too hyper or, or not hyper enough. But he said, I think you're going in the wrong direction. So, and I didn't want to. I, I thought, no, I this is my interpretation of Mr. Man, and uh, I'm going to do it. Now, I, I didn't give him any attitude, but I, I kind of argued my side. You know, I, I'd, I'd rather do it this way, you know, my way. Uh, he said, no, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's right for what we're doing here. Uh, so I, I, I mean, hey, he's the director. He's a friend. Okay. I, I mean, he's a funny guy. I trust him. Okay. So I just totally changed it. And I did it the way that your, your niece sees it. And uh, when I watched it, I, I thought the guy was right on. I, my, my interpretation would have been wrong. It wouldn't have been funny. So uh it was sometimes you know directors know what they're telling you you know <laughs> listen to and, them. <laughs> and that director by the way was howard storm <laughs> howard storm was the director and the stand-up comedian was uh billy There's crystal billy crystal yeah i was gonna say billy oh, crystal and great. jeff goldblum jeff and jeff goldblum. goldblum i mean we Holy were all shit. there it was <laughs> how know, cool it was great it was just amazing but a luck of the draw because nobody was famous nobody was anybody then wow we but were that's... all just actors showing up and 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 doing and doing the work too i mean that's i mean i mean again fred willard there's doris roberts on there and she's fantastic uh, I, I mean, uh, Jeff Goldblum and Billy Crystal, those are the big names that are popping out. Valerie. Yeah, listen, um, a, a fairy tale theater was a great show, and it, ha it always had top of the line actors, whether they were famous oh, or not. Yeah. So I don't doubt that for a second, that uh, the casting was amazing. I, I would watch the show. You know, it was like a children's show, but it was an adult show, too, because the, the actors were all right on. Oh, here, yeah. niece knows you're crazy, Carl. I'm sure Adam Sander allowed improv. Yeah, but by that, by then, um, I didn't like Adam at all, and I just wasn't <laughs> improv. Improv. He was a he. He's a prankster, and I just don't like pranksters. I don't like pranks. I have no sense of humor, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, funny. Uh, wait, wait. I gotta shut up. Shut this up. What the hell is going on? Okay. Yeah. Uh, really funny people don't have any sense of humor about themselves. I uh, uh, I learned that uh, I was reading. I read a lot of autobiographies and biographies of, of funny people, people that I think are funny, whether they're comedians or not. And uh, all of them just don't have any sense of humor. They, everybody says, yeah, he, he doesn't laugh at himself. He And uh, so pranks, pranksters to me are the enemy. I don't I don't like them. The you know, I don't. I get it. The I, if I got a pie in the face, maybe I wouldn't mind. <laughs> I mean, that's that's okay. a harmless prank. That's that's one of the no, oldest. No, that's, that's right on. That, that's that's a, that's bowling down the center. <laughs> <laughs> it's bowling one hundred and one. You know, but that happened to me at a Denny's once. The the waiter brought out a warm apple pie, big full pie. He he held it and he pretended to hit me in the face with it. But it started to slip, and he went to catch it and made full oh, contact boom. with the face. Needless to say, the whole table was calm that day. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody laugh? The whole restaurant. All right, there you yeah. go. Okay, <laughs> he got the laugh. Man, That's all. Man, that was, my, my man. Face, face and hair were just a, a covered. pie in the face from a 
a waiter in a restaurant. <laughs> that's the top of the line, man. I was, I was like, gonna say that's that's that, yeah, isn't that, I, I, that I saying about life company. imitating art, imitating life imitating art, that sort of thing. I mean, we've seen it so many <laughs> yeah. times in a cartoon, and here it actually warm happened. Apple pie. Oh, I mean, it was, the warm. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the warm is the thing that made it over the top. <laughs> Because there'll be a custard pie or a you know a cream pie. It's it's cold or at least room temperature. Yeah, at least it wasn't scalding hot. Warm was okay. Oh, it was hot. No, no, no. It was warm. At least it oh, wasn't it was hot. Warm. Yes, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> so, so, Larry, I'm 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 scrolling through again all of your IMDb credits here, and you have been on like all of my favorite shows. You have either been on. In fact, it's so funny. I was actually just looking. Uh, I just got done binging Star Trek Voyager, and you were on like four different episodes of that. I mean, it's it's amazing, just all the stuff. So I have a question for you because Wind Dancer, familiar Wind Dancer? No, no, you missed that one. That's my favorite role of all time, and second only to Escape from Alcatraz. That was Wind Star Dan Trek Voyager. What? That was Star Trek. Star Trek, yeah. Wind Dancer. Wind Dancer was a white volleyball with a face. <laughs> that amazing. was all. And it floated in the air. And I would <laughs> float over to somebody and talk to them. And I was a, I was a white uh, with, with red, uh, you know, like how a, a vo uh, or uh, not a volley, maybe not a volleyball, but you know they have a black and white uh, uh, hexagons on it. You know, right, like, soccer right. ball kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Soccer ball. Yeah. Okay. So they were red. So they were red and white hexagons, but there was eyes and a nose, and it was my face. What did you wear? Green underneath that. It in the air, and it would just come, and it would say, "Hey, <laughs> stop doing that." <laughs> <laughs> so, I loved so, it. I mean, you know, it's it just in one scene. That was yeah. That was Star Trek: uh, Next Generation. The episode oh. was Cost of Living in 1992. Oh so I'm going to have to go back and check that out. So that's uh And I love uh, it's just Next the Generation. Silliest acting I've ever done, and it's. Gr I mean, I just I want that on my my tombstone. Just that <laughs> picture. <laughs> you're so yeah. Like Mrs. Bannis is saying, you're. Your part in Home Alone was memorable. You're so memorable in everything you do. You just yeah, yeah. I don't understand that except um, when I was a little child, you know, like two, three, something. I don't remember. People told me that people would uh, come over to the carriage or to you know and, uh, pick or pick me up or uh, you know I was like a a weird kid. I mean, I was uh, <laughs> something about me. They 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 I don't know. I, I, I can never figure it out. I do remember my uncle used to throw me through the air. I mean, in other words, there was, uh, and that was where, where I was talking about the book, writing the book and the things that happened to me off stage. Yeah, when I walk down the street, things change. <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> People will just laugh spontaneously or or cry or or do something. Like, <laughs> I, was, I was on my bicycle the other day, uh, yesterday, and I pulled up to a traffic light, you know, and I'm just, right next to a car and it's red light and uh, people are passing in front of me. Uh, people are, uh, you know, it's one of those cross things where you can cross any way. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was, everybody was crossing, but only uh, two girls were crossing this way, you know, like straight in front of me at, at 180 degrees. Is that 90 or 80, uh, 90 or 180 when you this way, that way, you know, you know, I, I think I want to say 90. It's 90 degrees, yeah. She, she was degrees, two yeah. girls, okay. And very far off, somewhere, somebody was playing some, you know, music in a boombox, way the very far away, but you could slightly hear it. So she's walking and walking and walking, these two girls. And right as they got in front of me, and they looked, they looked at me, and I had my mask on even. So I didn't think they saw me. But as soon as they got in front of the bike, they started boogieing like crazy. <laughs> To the music, you know, and, <laughs> and all the way to the curb. Like, did I do something that I, what caused that? <laughs> That's what happens spontaneously when I walk down the street. You know, people, uh, sometimes recognize me okay, like a car. I'll go, hey, how you doing? Hey, hey, hey. I go crazy. 
<laughs> fans are weird. I don't. I don't think fans are weird. <laughs> they, they they are. It's amazing what you remembered for. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, and yet they still do recognize. You don't know my name. So <laughs> see what? No, go ahead, Jason. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Well, what's up? No, no. I was going to say, you know, and and you, it looks like you have a have a chance at people getting to know you a little bit more. You've got some stuff in uh, a couple things in post production right now. You're filming a couple of things right now too. Oh, uh, this, is all, like this is this is all according to IMDb. <laughs> so again, so I don't know how. So <laughs> what is it? Uh, stripped the TV series. You have a couple of episodes that are in post production right now. I uh, am. I didn't even know that. <laughs> you're, you're you you play Larry is a, is a, and again this is according to IMDb so it could also be full of shit so I don't no, know no 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 I think I got a phone call this is really weird man <laughs> <laughs> holy cow I'm losing it man but but again now, again you're also doing a, again I, I'm looking at one two three four five six things are in red right now uh so something was just announced that you're going to be doing Bengal, a voiceover is Bengal in there uh yes bengal. bengal is in there yeah that's in pre-production right now right i did uh, i just did that a couple of days ago yeah and uh, uh i hear the trees whispering and cadillac right. respect and what's the, the, the last one uh cadillac respect don't know don't so know. that one that one says it's filming right now so you you might not have been brought to the to <laughs> to, to the uh to the set just yet and then something that was just announced is bill uh bill plimpton's presents magnum farce where oh, you, uh, uh, yeah that's that's kind of in hiatus or or in uh, that's been banked that's that i did that a couple of years ago they're, they're still trying to sell didn't it didn't he pass away well, uh, bill plimpton yeah or am i thinking I don't know, he's a great cartoonist man oh he's amazing he's so he's I'm unbelievable cartoonist. yeah uh can I? I gotta ask you. I mean, it's a it's a generic question, but well, how, do, how what was it like working with John Candy? Did you uh, have good memories of that? Well, what you would expect. He's 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 great and so giving. He he gave me so much uh, uh, screen time. He uh, he. Um, I got a question for you, but I'll answer this first. Okay, he he's a, a great guy. He's a great human being. He's very giving. Uh, artist, actor, he would tell me stuff to do. Uh, there's two things that I'm I'm remembered for, but it was all from John Candy. Uh, in train, in trains, no, in is that uh, armed and dangerous? Armed and dangerous. Two things that I did that are I thank John Candy for. Uh, one was when they were giving out the guns and flashlights. Um, I was in. We were all in line. John Candy was behind me, and there was one guy in front of me, and there was a table. So the guy at the table was handing out guns and flashlights. Uh, so uh, the director said, okay, just get your gun, get your flashlight, and move on. Uh, and then when John Candy comes, I think that, that was all. John Candy just gets his flashlight and his gun. It was just a kind of a reveal scene. Yes. You know, just to where where they get the flashlights and the guns? They're handing them out. Okay, so I I okay and action, and the, the, the director. I was playing a guy on acid, uh, Kokolovich. I was playing him on acid. The director. This has happened to me many times. I'm kind of proud, but I don't understand it. The director thought I, Larry Hankin, was on acid. <laughs> then he thought that they had hired an acid freak to do the <laughs> guy. So he wouldn't come near me. He thought I was going to bite his nose or something. He just so he wouldn't give me any direction, anything. He would stay away from me. He wouldn't even talk to me. I didn't find this out until later where he confessed to me that I thought you were on acid. That's what he told me. You just had good an weeks answer. Later, weeks later, he told me this. Okay, so anyway, I'm on in in line, and uh, okay, and action. So he hands the, the guy in front of me, gets his flashlight, his gun. Next, I get up, hands me a flashlight, a uh, flashlight, no, a gun, and a flashlight, and I immediately just turned it on and stared into the light as I walked away. Um, okay, he yells, "Cut!" 
Now, here's a different attitude, the same words. Larry, what are you doing? <laughs> so I said, I'm looking into the flashlight. I, I, I'm, I'm talking... <laughs> I'm talking as a character. I, I always talk as the character if I'm on the set in costume and we just are shooting. What are you doing? I, I'm looking into the flashlight. Why? Because I'm on acid. <laughs> All right, just don't don't do that. Just, just get the flashlight and get off stage, okay? Just do that. And then John Candy goes, what are you doing? He says to the director. What are you doing? He says, I'm telling him not to look into the flashlight. No, and John Candy goes, no, that's that's funny. He said, no, it isn't. And they're standing there. Everybody's, there's about 100 people. It's a major movie. So about 100 people standing around a cruise, other people in this, it's a party or something. I don't know, there's a lot of people. And all of that, and standing there as they two say, it's funny, it's not funny. Well, it is funny. It should go in the movie. It's not going in the movie. It's not funny. And I'm just standing there listening to, to both of them. And he says, oh, and then John, because it's a director, John says, okay, all right. Um, you know, uh, and he says to me, I, I tried, Larry. Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, all right, just do it again. Don't do it to the flashlight thing. So I said, okay, I'm not going to argue, man. I mean, it's just such a small part. I don't care, you know. But I did think it was funny. So I thought it was clever. So uh, we, we do it again. Bump, 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 bump. Cut. Okay, moving on. And the cinematographer, who's a major cinematographer, right? he's very famous. I don't remember his name now. But he had he had station. He had, he had I don't know, whatever you call it. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. What happened to the flashlight thing? And the director says, uh, James, the guy was named James, something James. Uh, uh, Keach. James Keach, yep. James Keach. Says, uh, what what happened to the flashlight thing? And James goes, uh, it was cut. The cinematographer says, why was it cut? He said, because it wasn't funny. And the cinematographer says, but it was funny. And uh, the underlying theme <laughs> to everybody talking to the director is, we need as many laughs in this movie as we can get. You know, you're not hot shit with the laughs. You know, it's what they were saying, but they wouldn't say it. He was he was in a, he was hired because there was explosions in the movie, and he was a master of explosions. That's why he was directed. So he, when it came to humor, he didn't care. So the, the cinematographer says, "No, it's funny." He says, "It's not funny. It's not going in the movie. We're moving on." So the cinematographer says, "All right, hold it." He said, "I want you to just give me one shot. I want to do this scene again." Would you just let me do it one more time and let him do the, the flashlight? And I'm standing back and I'm going, what the fuck is going on, man? <laughs> this is crazy. It's just a laugh. It's a little, who cares? But it seemed to be a big thing, you know. So um, the, the James Keach finally gets fed up. And, and then now John Candy is moving in and, he is surrounding him too. So he got two guys on him. He says, okay, okay, let's do it again and let's get the hell out of here. I want to move on. We don't have any time. Okay. So then the cinematographer says, all right, can I have my crew, please? The camera crew. Okay, whoever is not working on this shoot, right, on this scene right now, I want you to just stand around the set. Just gather around anybody who's not working on this scene. And about 10, 10 guys gather around and say, nobody knows what's going on now because nobody has actually heard the, the words going on. So everybody is really, so now everybody's gathered around the set because was something going to happen. So, okay, so, so Keats is standing back. So now that the cinematographer is directed and he goes, uh, okay, I just want you to do the scene. We're just going to do the scene again, that's all. Okay, Larry, you want you to do the flashlight thing again? Okay, cool. All right, everybody act. Action. That gun thing thing, Larry. Uh, John Candy comes up, gets his gun, cut. And everybody around the set just falls down laughing. They, they held in until the thing was cut. Cut! <laughs> like that. Just like that. And I was so proud. 
I would <laughs> and fine, Keith says, all right, it's in. Moving on. <laughs> God, damn it. And so it, it, now, it, it added something. Well, it, it, by then it didn't matter whether it did or, or not. It was somebody, when John Candy said, yes, it's funny, and he said, no, the cinematographer said, no, this is like politics now. You know, no, no, Biden won the election. Yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what was going on. They, they, said, they just had to prove a point. It had nothing to do with it by, by then. Okay. So that, that I thank John Candy and the cinematographer. But John had a lot to do with it because he stood up first. Okay. There's another scene in the movie. We're, we're in the junkyard. We're in a, an actual garbage dump. It's me, John Candy, and uh, and his friend. Uh, from Eugene Central. Levy? Eugene Levy. Another great guy. Oh, yeah. Like, they're all wonderful people. Eugene and, and John are real people, like, like you guys, like me, like us, like mm -hmm. your viewers. We're just ordinary people who happen to be actors. Okay, so we're in the, the thing, and uh, John K uh, James Keach thought so little of the scene that he didn't even show up. He had second unit. It was just a second unit. It was just a cameraman, a sound guy, me, Levy, and John, uh, and that was it. Just, just five people. And a guy with a huge garbage dump. Okay, so the, the all the scene was they were looking for things. I don't remember why, but we were looking for things. Uh, I, I, I just don't know. What. But we were there and we had to find things. Uh, and I don't know what the things were or why. I don't remember what your character found, but it was something ridiculous and you pocketed it, right? Oh, John, so we're looking for things. And there's this big, huge m mound of garbage right nearby, which was great in the shot. And that's why we, we were there. It's huge. And we're looking. And I came up with, uh, and I came up with, I think it was a comb or a, or, or, or a comb, a pink comb. And I, so I thought, well, this will be funny if I found this. It's a, such, it was broken. You know, a couple of teeth were missing. So, so I found it. I go, hey, I found this. So John Candy goes, and, and we were, that was, that was improvised. We, we had no words except, hey, we found this. But so I come up to John and, and, and uh, Levy and I go, hey, um, I found this and I said, oh, also I found, I think a shoe. And I, and I said, <clears throat> improvising, I said, hey, I found a comb and I found a shoe. And it was a really old, stupid shoe. <laughs> it was old. I, said, I found a shoe. Uh, you guys know where another shoe is? A matching shoe? And, uh, you know, you see if you, and they, they just, no, we both didn't want, at first they didn't want to, they were using James Keach as as me. They, they didn't want to be near me. But it was in character, and it was right. They go, no, no, we don't know where another shoe is. And to get rid of me, John Candy said, I think there's a shoe on up there. I think I saw a shoe on top of that mound there. And he's very, you know, standoffish like. And they go, oh, up there? And he goes, yeah, up there. Go, okay, great. And I start going up. And then they cut away to John Candy and him looking for stuff. And then you hear me yell. And I did. I, I got up on top of the thing. And I said, hey, guys, I found it. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, I found it. And John yells, oh, that's great. And I yell, yeah, but wow. And I, fall. <laughs> and I disappear. <laughs> so that was all improvised. But it was off of John Candy and how he just said, no, it's up to you. want to get rid of me. <laughs> no, he just went with it. No, so that was the other thing that John Candy gave me. So that's a, that I thought was a clever, good Good laugh, me disappearing into That's the dark. That's hilarious. I fell into a hole because I just went poof like that, you know, not wall. <laughs> it's you know. so much it's funnier great. when you disappear. Yeah. So, so that's to explain. John was just a stand-up guy, 
and uh, he was always my friend. We were we were going to make a movie together, you know, right before he died. Uh, you know, we stayed in touch. We lived near one another in Hollywood at the time. Uh, so yeah, I just love the guy. Well, everybody loves That's him, great. and I yeah. love working with him. And he always gave you stuff. He he does have a funny mind. I mean, he'll he, you know you're working with him, and then he'll go, "Hey, why don't you, you know, why don't you find a shoe, or you know, why don't you go up there?" Or he'll he'll tell you something that's funny. Yeah. And Larry David is the same way. That, that's how he directs. He'll just tell you something that's so funny. Uh, I, I just watched Larry David direct when I did uh, Seinfeld. I just w would watch him direct. I would just show up just to watch Larry David. He doesn't direct. He doesn't direct the show. He stands off to the side and he just watches, you know, kind of with his arms across his chest. He just watches very silently. And then every once in a while, I didn't do it much, but he'll just call over one of his major actors, you know, like Jerry or, you know, uh, Costanza. and say, hey, uh, come here, come here. And he'll go. And again, he takes you off to the side, you know, and he'll just. And I was always I would always watch him. And inevitably, he did this three times while I was there to three different people. He'll take your side. He'll watch a scene, and you're watching the scene. Okay. And he'll say, hey, come here. And you're like, Costanza, they can say, come here. And I always wondered what the hell he said. But each time, the actor would go back into the scene, and it would be funnier. It would just be funnier. I don't know what he told the guy. And I was thinking, why doesn't he tell me something? I want to be funny like that. <laughs> you, know, I mean, I you were, you were great in that. Why is he me? You know, why didn't he tell me? And finally he did. He did. And and my character, the key to my character, which was kind of, I didn't improvise anything. It was on the page. But I kind of thought he's kind of passive aggressive. Uh, <clears throat> it was, a, you know, the Kramer guy, uh, Tom Pepper. Uh, I was kind of, I'm getting from the vibes from the page. I'm getting, uh, he's kind of passive aggressive. He's either angry or he's nothing. He's just one or the other. So I just, and um, I said nothing. And I got nothing from actually zero from Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton grew up in show business in vaudeville. And that, that face that he does, that stone face of Buster yes. Keaton was called zero because his father he had a, he was a trained tumbler, a tumbler. What he would do is his father would pick him up by the seat of the pants. He had, you know, special pants where he could pick him up by the belt. And he was like five. So it was easy to pick him up. And at certain stages, he would come out. His father and his mother had an act. And at one point, this five-year-old would come out. And his father, in some way, would say, get off the stage. And he wouldn't, the five-year-old. So he would pick him up by the back of his belt, you know, so the kid was hanging like this and he would throw him against the backdrop, you know, this canvas, the, you know, the, the in yeah. one. Well, if you hit that, it, it, it goes like that, you know, and then what happens is you slide down it cause it goes, you know, like that. So he never got hurt, but what his father would say to him, okay, kid zero. And what zero meant was totally relax, go go neutral, so that you're 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 floppy when you hit that. So it's not a hard hit. You're just floppy. So you go zero, boom, and throw it. And you go, and it would of course bring down the house. And oh my God! And the kid would just get up and skip off. You know? <laughs> oh wow, that's really great. So I said, okay, so that's where I got zero from. So it was in my mind, and, I, and I, there's a reason for it. So okay. He comes up to me and he says, Larry David, he calls me over and he says, oh, it's my turn. He's going to give me something funny. So he says, um, <laughs> as opposed to the other two, this is what he said. I know what you're doing. And I go, oh, really? And he said it with such um, an, an accuse, with an attitude. <laughs> I like, can that. Anybody. Like, like that. Now, I know what you're doing. No, 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 it was the, no. He said, this is what got me angry. He said, I know what you're trying to do. It was the trying, the word trying. And it just got me pissed off. 
And I don't care who he is. I'm going to get pissed off back at him. And I said, oh, really? What am I trying to do? And he said, you're trying to do nothing. And it just blew my mind because that's exactly what I was trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't ready for that. So I go, oh, wow. Yeah, that's right. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah. He says, well, you're doing something. And he walked away. And I thought, best direction I ever got. Best direction, man. He just. That's amazing. Yes. It, it, because he didn't tell me what to do. He, he just told me what I was doing. And it was wrong. But he didn't say it was wrong. He just said, well, you're doing something. And it just. Keyed me right into, and I got, that's how I got Tom Pepper. Just, just from that, I said, ah. So that's when he said, you know, uh, uh, I don't, uh, or any other dried fruit. That, that sentence, that little speech came from Larry David's telling me you're doing something. I, you know, I just, it just focused me on the, on the characters. I don't know that that's my relationship to directors is is great and yet it's weird because they, I don't think any they talk to any other actors that way because well, you, you, like you don't put up you, you you speak your mind to them I think it sounds like yeah and so they speak their mind to me you know and 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 then there's a but I, I, it's based on the re, the relationship you know uh, Larry David uh, wasn't. Uh, I was hoping you weren't going to say that taking the raisins was your improv. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah. That was really clever. Larry David. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, uh, yeah, you just you, you try to get along. You know, I, I, you know, but the way I try to get along is a little different, just a little different. You're honest. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully. Hopefully so. And they're honest with me, you know. And we're going to be honest with you right now, Larry. This has been such a treat to get to talk with you. It truly oh, has. Yeah, we, we've we've sadly come to that time, though. We've got a wrap, my friend. And, okay, uh, well, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Next time it's going to cost you. <laughs> How is the progress on your book coming? Before we go, I, I would... I, well, would I got 30 book, pages I done, but uh, uh, half of it is kind of what, what I was telling you about my show business stories. It's, it's a lot of those stories. And then what I did, you know, when I was off and, you know, just at home. Uh, but, but there's stories about me, you know, with, with Adam and with uh, James and with John Candy and with, you know, uh, John Houston. I mean, some of them are just, they're just great people. Uh, my time on Escape from Alcatraz was, uh, a, a learning experience because it was the first movie, major movie that I was ever in. And it was with Clint Eastwood and Don Siegel. And they were just huge stars and great, incredible. great, incredible actors uh, and, and directors. They, they're very high up there. And that was my first big thing. So I learned a lot there and I carried it on with me to this day. So next time, maybe we'll talk about Alcatraz or something. Oh, we'd we'll love to do, uh, to definitely dedicate a uh, an episode to that. And uh, folks, if you want to know what Larry's up to, go to thereallarryhankin.com. Yeah, it's uh, all small letters, though. Uh, I, that, that has it it'll, it'll I, get in there. It doesn't matter. I guess it doesn't matter. No, I just I, I like to capitalize so that people can read oh, okay. it, especially okay. so. Okay. Thereallarryhankin.com. But check it out and uh, and please uh, invest in uh, the wonderful things he has uh, there for you. Like uh, I know he has a, oh, a fun t shirt for sale. I got a, one commercial. Yeah. That's all. That's it. I have you go to that site uh, or T Public and go to that's one word T E E P U B L I C dot com. Uh, I have a, a, a keep it down, a Mr. Echoes t shirt. That's really cool. Yeah. Oh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm going to the website right now. I'm 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 trying to pull it up fast. Come on, be my be my friend, internet. Okay, I'm gonna try well, to pull to, it up. Go to tpublic.com and just type in Larry Hankin. When you say John Houston, did you mean John Hughes or did you work with both? Oh, John Houston and John Hughes. That's both incredible. Great. Jeez oh. Louise. Oh, I have a question for you. Yeah. yeah. Keep it. Uh, yeah. There, there. Keep it. Uh, can you see it? There it is. There it is. Oh, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> so get oh. yours today, friends. Yeah, I'm yeah right. Like to get one. It says nine. It says five minutes after nine. Your clock, Jason. Oh, this is a. 
It's been five minutes after nine since we brought the clock home. My wife found that at a thrift store and refinished it for 10 bucks and she turned it into art. But it's always nine, five minutes, seven minutes, six minutes after nine. Six minutes after nine. It, it is. You're not still on acid. Zero minutes. hour when it's all going to go down the tubes. When, 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 the, when the clock. Oh, wow. Look at my Armageddon. Hair. That's Armageddon. Okay, anyway, I'm <laughs> Armageddon, six minutes after nine. Remember that, folks. You heard it here first. <laughs> and Mrs. Bannis agrees she needs that shirt. I think we all need that shirt. So make sure you go to thereallarryhankin.com, get that shirt. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much to uh, Mr. Larry Hankin for spending some time right. with us. For, for the record... Larry called. Larry caught us. Caught on to us. This is the Twilight Zone. We filmed for one minute the entire show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do it again. I can remember everything. I can remember. Okay, let's just do it again. Right. Yeah. We just. Well, we're gonna, we're going to do it, but we have to go a hundred yards out first. So. <laughs> towards the camera. I'll go back there and walk towards the camera. <laughs> Oh, good callback. Good callback. And <laughs> ladies and gents, we will see you uh, next Wednesday. Are we next Wednesday, Jason? No, not next Wednesday. Two Wednesdays right. from now. Two Wednesdays from now. And who is our guest in two Wednesdays? I can't remember his name, but he lived with Groucho Marx for three years. Steve, I should remember his name. So we're, <laughs> we're, Kaufman, he's Groucho no. Marx's personal secretary. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Get the Groucho. Yeah, you, yeah. So, folks, yeah. make sure to tune in for that in a couple of weeks. Have a great rest of your weekend. Well, we will see you. Yes, sir. Don't forget I'm to put our live show. Larry, thank oh. you so much. I just wanted to thank you again for taking the time. I'd love to have you back sometime. Okay. Give me a call anytime, man. Thank okay. you, man. Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> see ya. He was awesome, Justin. Oh, what a great show. Yeah. Holy shnikes, was, man. And the other thing is, next Saturday, we have our live show. I just wanted yes, to plug we do. that. 12 to 3, weather permitting. If it's as nice as it is supposed to be this week, we'll be in for a good, a good afternoon. We got magic. We got comedy. We got music. It's going to be a great time. Uh, we have, uh, as, as guests, of course, it's going to be, Hi, I'm Jason, live, 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 with Jason Pollock and Justin Gonzalez. That's me. And uh, we have three wonderful guests. We have uh, a former contributor to Saturday Night Live, Mr. Mark Riccadonna. We have uh, an actress and an incredibly funny lady. You may have seen her on uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Katrina Braxton. And then, uh, and why am I, oh gosh, I can't believe it. I'm forgetting his name right Eric now. Jones. Eric Jones, you would have seen him on Fool Me, Penn and Teller's Fool Me, or on Fool America's us. Got, uh, Fool Us, geez Louise. And uh, uh, America's Got Talent, um, just a one of the best practitioners of sleight of hand. Uh, and you get to see all of that for free on the 15th. It's our gift to our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You're welcome. <laughs> so, so Louise, get on, get on the plane and come on over. <laughs> and Mr. Bannis, bring your husband from Staten Island. There's coffee. Oh, yes, yes. There's coffee. There's. A, I believe. I believe. Just like today, though. I know. Uh, and a shout out to Tom Bannis. He popped in a little bit uh, earlier. Yes. He. Uh, I know. He's out working. He's gigging. He's. Uh, he's especially now that people are starting to get back together. Uh, people are starting to do things, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping. I, I, I'm, I believe he said he's going to be working next Saturday. But uh, if if he's not, come on down, you guys. Come on down to beautiful, historical Mount Holly, New Jersey, the Colonial Cafe. And uh, I think that's it, Jason. I think that that's, is all our stuff. That's a wrap. Justin, when is your next show? My next show will be. Uh, I have I have some small private things during the week uh, that that I'm doing. I'm doing a, a couple of uh, of my one man shows that I do for some private audiences, and then uh, I think the next public thing that I'm doing is actually our show. And then after that, I will be doing a show for the Marian Anderson Historical Society in Philadelphia. That'll be next Sunday. So please go to Justin Gonzalez Tenor on Facebook to find out a little bit more about that. 
please do. And how about you, Jason? Are, do we have anything fun and uh, crazy uh, planned for this week? Next Thursday, I'll be at the Candlelight Theater with Coleman Green and Tim Grill and Sherry Franklin. Oh, that's and beautiful theater. June 17th at the Candlelight, it'll be me with Irene Bremis and Carmen Lynch. It's going to be a fun, fun show, June 17th. I'm looking forward to wow. that one. That's going to be awesome. And Candlelight Theater down in beautiful Delaware. Arden, Delaware. Yes, just outside of uh, just outside of Wilmington. So if you're uh, in our neck of the woods, uh, South Jersey, Philadelphia area, it's not that far of a drive. It's a beautiful theater. And uh, again, these are going to be awesome shows. You don't want to miss them. Justin, thank you for everything. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Oh, you too, my friend. Stay well, everyone, and we will see you again very, very soon. Bye-bye now. See ya.